Good evening, members and friends of the International Music and Art Society. Today is indeed a special evening for all of us. In December of 1974, Rani Vijay Devi of the Mysore Royal Family established the International Music and Art Society at the suggestion of her brother Jay Chamaraja Wadiyar, the Maharaja of Mysore, a great patron of the arts in the tradition of the Mysore Royal House. Gathering together a group of close friends, Mrs. Ila Chandrasekhar, Mrs. Felice Mathur, Mrs. Jeannie Karas, and Mrs. Prema Bhaktavatsala, who, like her, were deeply cosmopolitan aficionados of music, dance, and the arts, to form the society, it led to an incredibly prolific, inclusive, and diverse 40 years and more, hosting the best of Western, Hindustani, and Carnatic music, dance, and painting, all for the benefit of a growing Bangalore audience. The unwavering member support and staggering variety of artists through so many years has given the IMAS a special character among the city's cultural organizations. And it is this special character that we celebrate today as we proudly release our commemorative retrospective volume of 40 years of the International Music and Art Society and on our Founders Day anniversary, the birthday of Rani Vijaya Devi and the end of her centenary year, no less. So, uh, a cheer to her memory. <laughs> Wonderful lady she was. I had the honor of meeting her. Uh, that unpleasant announcement, which is part of every event. I just checked. I'm, I've switched off my phone. If you guys can do the same, either switched off or silenced, that would be a help. So, welcome to uh, the Bangalore International Center. Always a wonderful venue uh, to perform at. My name is Uday Martin. And uh, we'll now commence our program with the traditional lighting of the lamp. And of course, uh, Sri Yadavir Krishnadatta Samaraj Vadiyar of the Mysore Royal House on stage now to light the lamp in the presence of Padma Sri Awardi Malavika Sarukai and our authors Urmila Devi Kodda Sangani, Indira Bruna Chandrasekhar, and Tatiti Kunja Balal. the pleasure of hearing two compositions of Maharaja Shri Jai Chamaraja Wadiyar performed by Vidushi Apeksha Apala, accompanied by Vidwan Kartikeya R on the violin and Vidwan Nikshit Puttur on the Mridangam. A national award-winning vocalist, Vidushi Apeksha is a seasoned performer of both All India Radio and the stage. She hails from the illustrious Carnatic classical music tutelage of Sangeeta Kalaratna Vidushi M.S. Sheila, who in turn was the senior student of Vidwan R.K. Srikantan. Vidwan R.K. Srikantan performed the first of the Kritis you will hear today in 1978, a tribute to Ganapati at a memorial concert honoring the Maharaja for a still very young IMAS. This was at a time when his compositions were rarely performed. This singular event is one of many you will find recorded in the book. Let's hear this. Namaste. We feel extremely privileged and honored to perform Maharaja Jayacham Rajendra Vadiyar's compositions today. We would like to thank IMES for this wonderful opportunity. 
we are going to start our presentation with a kriti on Lord Ganesha seeking his blessings in the Raga Athana set to Aditara.
We are now going to present a composition in Raga Hindola set to Jampe Tada. Ah <laughs> 
Thank you for that wonderful performance. Uh, may I invite? Uh, yeah, let's let's have uh, another go at it. Yeah, very terrific. May I invite uh, Urmila Devi on stage to felicitate our artists. We now come to the highlight of the evening, the launch of our 40th anniversary commemorative volume. The book itself has been a labor of love and dedication, spanning a rich 40 years worth of archival material and photos, some of which you've been seeing play on the screen behind me. Finally, having it on page and in print, as it were, serves as more than just an album of IMAS events past. It's a chronicle of a changing city, a growing membership, and the steady evolution of homegrown and international artistry. As IMAS enters its golden chapters, this volume is a gift for audiences to come, as well as a tribute to so many who feature in its pages and are interwoven with its enduring legacy. The book itself will be available for sale at the end of today's program. Please do pick up a copy. We are proud to have Shri Yadavir Krishnadatta Samaraja Wadiyar, scion of the erstwhile royal house of Mysore and the Wadiyar dynasty with us as our chief guest. Today, the thoroughly modern face of an ancient lineage and the custodian of a legacy dating back to the Vijayanagara Empire, Sri Yadavir embodies both the uniquely culturally progressive yet purely traditional world of the Mysore palace himself a literature and economics graduate of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is an active champion and protector of Mysore's rich heritage, its artistic treasures, ecology, sustainable development, and modern education. He serves as the ambassador and advisory board member of the Kalisu Foundation, founder of the heritage-focused heritage Berunda Foundation also, Advisory Chairman of the Cyberverse Foundation and President of the Sri Jai Chamaraja Urs Education Trust, all while simultaneously performing countless other custodial and representative roles, preserving and supporting the Mysore region's still unchallenged through line of good governance, cultural artistry, and broad scientific temper. Always an honor to have you amongst us, sir. Uh, may I invite you up on stage now with our three authors and the designer of the book, Surabhi Gurukar. So that all important photo is done. If you could please present a copy each to the authors and the designer. personalities present here today, my many family members, friends, acquaintances, members of the managing committee of the International Music and Arts Society, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you. It is my proud privilege to be here this evening to release the 40th anniversary commemorative uh, volume uh, that I think has given us a great picture into what the last 40 years has been for the IMAS here in Bangalore and of course across our state. So I extend on behalf of the palace my many congratulations to all of you on this momentous occasion. 
and I hope that I IMAS will continue to be a beacon for the arts in the many years to come. I have many of you, I think, will already know of the founding of the International Music and Arts Society, as mentioned, of course, before was on the advice of uh, my revered grandfather, His Highness Jayatam Raja Wadir, saying that the, a special vehicle or a special medium was required in order for the very profound legacy of Rani Vijaya Devi's to continue to pro propagate through society. And uh, in many ways, it was pioneering at the time because I think singularly, other than perhaps the more legacy trusts of the family, no one else had set up at the time, a contemporary vehicle to propagate the arts and continue that Mysore tradition of being uh, culturally active. So it was indeed, at the time, a very pioneering effort and something that has enriched all of our lives um, in the years that have come. I have been fortunate to attend many events uh, in my youth and then, of course, several after I've taken up the responsibility here in Mysore. And I can say singularly that each and every one event has enriched my own uh, understanding of the arts beyond just having an enjoyable evening. I've come away all the more educated about the arts and the Mysore legacy as well. So it's a personal debt of gratitude that I'm serving here today and one that is owed, I think, by all of us to the founder, Indrani Vijayadevi of Kota Sangani, her efforts towards ensuring that the Mysore legacy was uh, uh, put together or rather uh, concretized in this IMAS was, I think, uh, very laudable at the time and has served us for so many years now that truly we must owe this de deep debt of gratitude to her. So on doing that and once again thanking you all for having me here today. I should also mention that uh, I'm very honored to be here at the Bangalore International Center. I mentioned before that I wish to come here, and it is, I think, very fitting that uh, such a modern edifice that pays homage to, uh, I think, in many ways, uh, the tribute of our built heritage here in Bangalore should serve as purpose for an institution that, uh, while very much rooted in the deep legacy of Mysore, uh, is very contemporary and continues to be an ethos for our modern society. So I think it's a very apt place to be having this. So my congratulations to you on the construction of this uh, Bangalore International Centre as well. And once again, congratulations to all of you on the 40th year anniversary of the International Music and Arts Society. I hope and pray and I know it will continue to serve us and enrich our lives for many decades to come. And it is uh, truly an honour to be part of this. I should of course mention the many patrons that have been uh, adding value and uh, been a supporting pillar to the International Music and Arts Society from the Governor uh, to Mr. S. M. Krishna to my own uh, revered father, late His Highness Sri Kantadatta Narasim Rajwadir, all of whom who have uh, been very active patrons of the society and continue to propagate that same legacy set up by uh, Anti Vijay. So once again, I thank you all for having me here today and giving me this uh, lovely opportunity to pay my small debt of gratitude to what has added tremendous value to my own life via this commemorative volume. Thank you so much for having me and wish you all once again a very good evening. Thank you, sir, for taking time out to be with us. Uh, I think the next two uh, events will be done where you are seated to make it easier for everyone. So I now call upon our founder member, Mrs. Prema Bhaktavatsala, to present a copy of the book to guest of honor Malvika Sarukai. And now our vice president, Feroz Bharada, will present a copy to former governor of West Bengal, Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi. Yeah, hugely honored to have you also, sir, in our, in our midst. Okay, moving on. We'd now like to introduce you to the three extraordinary members behind every word and image of this wonderful project. The first of our archivists is, of course, 
Urmila Devi Kodda Sangani, whose steadfast custodial spirit. Yeah, Picking up where I left off, whose steadfast custodial spirit, creativity and enthusiasm on behalf of the society her mother founded has been unstinting and guaranteed the unique longevity we celebrate today. Urmina Devi long ago emerged as a true champion of the arts and benefactor to the cultural landscape of Bangalore. May I request you to come on stage, uh, Urmila? Wherever you are. Oh, there you are. I must say first and foremost that I rarely ever give speeches or talks, so this will be very short. But uh, welcome and thank you all for being present at this milestone event of the International Music and Art Society. Each of you has been special in the IMAS's almost 50 year journey and evolution. We are most grateful to have uh, my nephew, Sri Yadavi Krishnadatta Chamraj Wadiyar, for, uh, to launch the book and for his eloquent and quite kind words about the founder and the society. Thank you. He has inherited the mantle of the family's patronage of the arts and despite his youth, acquits himself with grace and humility. Our grateful thanks to Vidushi Apeksha Appala for her melodious rendering of Maharaja Jaicham Rajwadiyar's two kritis and her accompanists, Vidwan Kartikeya on the violin and Vidwan Nishik, Nikshit sorry, Putur on Mridangam. We are also indebted to... Uh, Malavika Sarukai for her support for this special occasion and generously agreeing to put her artistic imprimatur on the evening by sharing her reflections on dance with us later. We have had the privilege of hosting her debut dance performance in Bangalore in the early years of the society and this features in our book. I am uh, not going to speak about the making or production of this book as that would need another book I think. <laughs> I'm sure the two authors and editors will agree with me. I am instead going to briefly acknowledge all the people who were part of the society's journey and my own involvement in the arts. Here, I would like to pay tribute to my mother, Rani Vijay Devi, and express my deep gratitude to her. It is particularly fitting that we are celebrating this launch at the end of her centenary year, and that um, her great-grand-nephew, Sri Yaduvir, Krishnadatta Chamraj Badiyar, was a part of it. I think this would make her spirit very happy. At this very important juncture in the society's existence, I have to salute her foresight in starting a cultural society to promote the arts in Bangalore, spurred on, as it were, by the suggestion of her brother, Sri Jai Chamraj Badiyar, Maharaja of Mysore, with whom she shared a close bond and a love and appreciation of both Western music and Carnatic music. As has already been mentioned, it had long been a tradition of the Maharajas of Mysore to patronize the arts. Uh, in an article in our book titled The Cultural Life in the Palace, my mother talks about this cultural patronage in her youth. Little would she have thought that almost half a century later, the society founded and nurtured by her would have shown such resilience and would have, with its dedicated committee members, and through its commitment to excellence, have carved a special place in the vibrant cultural life of the city. Um, my task as the archivist uh, for the book project was made much easier by the fact that my mother had carefully preserved all the programs of the society held over the years, and also in the way of people of many others of her generation, maintained a scrapbook with most of the newspaper articles that had appeared on the society and its work over the years. This made our task very much easier because we were able to uh, find so much material on the society when we were uh, you know, researching the book. While my mother fostered in me a love of Western music, I also owe a great debt to my father, sadly long past, who played a great part in my appreciation of the arts. As a diplomat posted abroad, he always took us, that is my two older sisters and myself, 
young as we were, to see any visiting Indian artists. And so rather paradoxically, we saw many of India's greatest artists, um, greatest names outside India, like the legendary uh, Uday Shankar, who performed in the US when we were there, and his no less famous brother, Ravi Shankar, who performed uh, in Rome while we were there. These early experiences, though I was too young to really remember Uday Shankar properly, whetted my interest in the arts, and eventually, through my association with the IMAS, greatly enriched my life. To go off at a bit of a tangent, I am reminded of a quip by the inimitable and charming Shashi Tharoor, uh, but in a completely different context, when asked by a sort of gushing fan about his many dazzling qualities, who said, choose your parents wisely. I would say I was lucky with mine. I would be failing in my duty if I did not acknowledge, uh, acknowledge Mrs. Ila Chandrasekhar, our second president, whose invaluable suggestion it was to bring out a book on the Society's work to celebrate its 40th anniversary. My only regret is that she is not here with us on this momentous occasion. Though the book has taken us more time than we imagined for various reasons, and the society is now in its 48th year, I think she would have been more than happy to see the final product. I would be remiss if I did not extend my heartfelt thanks to three people who have been responsible for the production of this remarkable cultural documentation of the IMAS, if I can allow myself a little conceit. Indira Chandrasekhar Bruner, who led the project and painstakingly wrote most of the text. <laughs> whose dedication and determination to honor her mother's vision, despite many challenges, was both impressive and inspiring. Secondly, but not in any way uh, really second, Pratiti Punja Balal, our editorial <laughs> consultant, whose meticulous proofreading and single-minded focus on quality added immeasurable value to the book. And the third person, Surabhi Gurukar, who undertook the daunting task of the layout and giving our thoughts and articles <laughs> a visual dimension. She exercised immense, immense patience through the long process, and our sin sincere thanks are due to her. As the granddaughter of Karnataka's famous artist K.K. Hebar, she showed her inherent artistic skills in the design of our book. Without the interest and the encouragement of the International Music and Art Society Committee, all of whom are here, and our administrative secretary, who have um, constantly ensured that the society functions as a cohesive whole, our project would not have been possible. Of course, my grateful and sincere thanks on IMAS's behalf to our members and supporters whose goodwill and, and um, support to us have been our true inspiration in our long innings. Last but not least in my long list of thank yous is Bangalore International Center, who have been our kind partners for many events. Uh, the BIC's well-equipped premises have been our choice for most of our events since the pandemic waned. Our thanks to Ravi Chandra, their dynamic director, the new jo uh, joint director, Mr. Bhatt, Sandhya, Lekha, Saraswati, and others on their efficient staff. Many thanks, and once again, thank you all for being here with us. Thanks, Urmila. That was from the heart. Next, we welcome uh, Pratiti Punja Balal, our book's award-winning editorial consultant. Also on the advisory committee, Pratiti contributed her decades of experience working with publications and academia in the US and India. Every paragraph was refined with her characteristic meticulousness, patience, and keen appreciation for the written word. She contributes to many cultural platforms in our city, and the IMAS is grateful for her involvement with this opus. Good evening. 
It's with some measure of disbelief that I stand here today at the conclusion of this project that has taken us a few years. It was a privilege to be a part of it with all the reading on the visual and performing arts from which we have learned so much. The International Music and Arts Society was very much a part of my childhood and it's been a great privilege to go through its archives. Rani Vijay Devi's priceless scrapbooks and a treasure trove of information on the arts from the post-independence years when artists were forging an identity for the arts in the still young nation, drawing on what was going on in the international world with movements such as modernism and yet firmly grounded in their local traditions. As others have mentioned this evening, Maiso epitomized this capacious ability to learn from both the local and the universe outside, as did the quiet and charming Bangalore we grew up in. If you saw the slides that we began with, there is an astounding variety of programming that the society has presented, from textile exhibitions to classical and contemporary dance, to music, Indian and Western of many genres, classical and jazz. The society has many firsts to its credit, the Symphony Orchestra of India's first performance outside Mumbai, M.F. Hussain and K.K. Hebar's first major shows in Bangalore. Uh, Urmila just mentioned uh, Malvika's debut recital in Bangalore. And the list goes on. There have been several legendary artists who have performed. Uh, we were just saying the other day that it's pretty unbelievable that the jazz pianist Billy Taylor played for the society and the trumpeter Woody Shaw uh, shortly, a few years before he passed. My mother always remembered, even years later, Kalakshetra's remarkable dance dramas in 1976, for which Rukmini Devi Arundel, a patron of our society, came down herself, Usha Parinayam and Sita Swayamvaram. As a young piano stu student growing up in the quiet Bangalore of the 70s and 80s, my first exposure to instrumental ensembles of international repute was through the International Music and Arts Society's concerts. Today, it's hard to imagine a world before television and the internet. These were very exciting events for us, and I was thrilled to be asked to turn pages once for a visiting artist. One of my earliest memories of seeing a large orchestra is the Swiss Police Orchestra, presented by the Society in 1977. And I remember my mother took us to the RSI grounds um, for the show. There are many memories. When we were preparing for mu music exams once, uh, Rani Vijay Devi invited a few senior students to play for a gathering with a visiting pianist, which was, needless to say, quite terrifying. Um, and I look back on the commemorative evening dedicated to Rani Vijay Devi in 2006 after she had passed, which I attended with my aunt in the serene environment of Smriti Nandan, and the gracious speakers that evening, Sudha Reddy, Laitha Ubaikar, Leela Ramanathan, and Leela Chandrasekhar, all pioneering women in their own right, who sadly are no longer with us. Unfortunately, one of the experiences in the course of writing this book has been the astonishing number of people who passed. During the years of this book, for me personally, several family members, my mother who had encouraged me with the project when we started it, my grandmother, parents-in-law, aunts and uncles, and from the society, our kind and gracious former president, Ila Chandrasekhar, who is greatly missed, and several others who spoke, performed, and exhibited their work. Dr. John Marr, Rajan, Pandit Jasraj, recently John Fritz, and Shobita Punja, among others. In many ways, their contribution, which this book records, is a tribute to them. Working on the book was something of a crash course with all of the enriching, intensive reading we did on the performing and visual arts and artists of the last four decades in India and around the world. But of course, you know, there are some moments that stick out and stay with you among all of these biographies and ideas um, that we came across. To mention a few, Kuchipudi Guru, Vempati Chinna Satyam, who, at the age of 18, with only two rupees, 
left his village of Kuchipudi in Andhra Pradesh and walked 400 kilometers to make the journey to Madras, where he propagated and established the dance form. Um, I know there are some students of his here today. There were many lessons in that sense of purpose and dedication, often at great cost, and the immense struggles of artists. Pandit Jasraj's story, his brother apparently wanted him to play the tabla, but having heard Begum Akhtar on the gramophone at a tea shop near his home, he was determined to become a singer. One of her guzzles, he said, had bewitched him. Instead of going to school, he says he'd I'd loiter on the footpath outside Yakubia restaurant since they would play it on a loop. That footpath was my music school where I got my first lessons. Then there is Rukmini Devi Arundel's belief that beauty lies in the detail, an idea I found easy to embrace, and I know many friends and family in the room are chuckling as I say this. There are some quiet gems uh, the photo you saw earlier of Rani Vijaydevi and Maharaja Jaicham Rajawadiyar's meeting with Rachmaninoff at his villa in Lucerne just before the war broke out. Uh, of course, the Maharaja's patronage of the composer Metner that Paul Stewart documents so beautifully in his article in the book. An account by the Maharaja's private secretary, Safi Darasha, in an article titled <laughs> Leaves from Memory's Golden Book. I so distinctly remember, he writes, that whenever some of us staff officers were summoned to the palace fairly late at night to receive urgent instructions from His Highness, we would find the Maharaja at his study table with a book before him and the radiogram softly purring one of the latest LP records of his beloved classical music. He goes on to describe the detailed reviews the Maharaja wrote, his founding of the Metna Society, and the recordings, publications, concerts, and orchestras that he supported. So working on the book has been something of a time trip for all of us. We've pored over old photographs, newspaper articles, reviews, and accounts of many people, places, and institutions in Bangalore and elsewhere. It's given us many insights into the evolution of the arts in our city, since the 70s when, excuse me, when the society was first formed. The lives of the founders of the society and many of the artists presented traversed the 20th century and saw the sea changes of post-independence India. Cultural memory is transient, rarely surviving beyond a performance or exhibition. We hope this book is a record of a remarkable generation. Speaking of change, we recently heard of changes in the arts in the UK, which resonated with what we see in Bangalore when we spoke to David Waterman, the cellist of the Andalian String Quartet, one of the premier string quartets in the UK until they recently retired. They performed twice for the society in Bangalore. When we did play in Bangalore, he said, it was a wonderful feeling because somehow the music society there was so recognizable to us. We felt very at home, I would say. It was run by music lovers. It felt like a music club or a music society in Britain, of which there used to be hundreds when my quartet started in 1979, but which are dying out somewhat now and things are organized by professional promoters and so on. I love the feeling, he said, of a group of music lovers in a particular town or city coming together and forming a committee and raising the money and finding a hall and organizing a tour and inviting people and then looking after them really, really well, which we were in Bangalore. A hallmark of the society has indeed been the friendships and relationships it has nurtured with artists. One of the tasks I was assigned was to write an article on what chamber music is and some of the chamber ensembles that have performed for the society. I'd like to share some of the discoveries in the course of writing the article. So um, the epithet music of friends is often used for the intimate and personal idiom of chamber music, but the origin of the term is unknown. It was used by Richard Henry Waltu, we know for the first time, well, that's the only record we have, um, in a published lecture for the South Place Institute London in 1909. 
To my amazement, we found that Waltzio's grandson had been an orchestra conductor and teacher of Karl Lutschmeier, who has performed several piano recitals for the society. It was serendipitous to find a living connection to an obscure 19th century source, and this is one of many such instances along the way. Um, to extend the metaphor of friendship further, Chamber music was famously compared to conversation by Goethe, and one scholar proposes a parallel to French salon conversation, an art form with rules of etiquette, described by the playwright Marivaux as effortless, unaffected, refined. To me, these three adjectives embody an aspirational ideal in making something beautiful together, whether it's a, conversational, a conversation, a marriage or relationship, making music, or writing a book. We don't always get there, of course. As Vikram Sitz describes in his lyrical novel about a string quartet and equal music, it is that willful quest for something beyond ourselves that we imagine with our separate spirits, but are compelled to embody together. I hope that our book gives you some sense of that quest. So before I close, I'd like to, of course, thank uh, my co-authors, uh, Urmila Devi and Indra Chandrasekhar, um, and uh, my family who are here today, my brother and family, Girish, Priya, and Alicia, my cousin, Rithi, who never attends book launches and made an exception, my sister-in-law, Mala, and several kind cousins who indulge me with their presence. I'm also thrilled to have three of my teachers in the room. My first teacher from nursery school, Ms. Sushila Mani, who taught me the alphabet and numbers. <laughs> my high school English teacher who introduced us to the wonders of Shakespeare, Mrs. Elizabeth Joseph, and my college literature professor, Mrs. Annie Chandy Matthew, who brought the 19th century and the romantic poets to life for us. How often does that happen? Um, it's an honor to have you all here. Many of you have made the trek across Bangalore to be here, and some of you have come from outside, uh, out of town as well. It's quite a journey. Heartfelt thanks to all of you who are here to celebrate with us. Thanks. Yeah, Pratiti, you're, you're, you're certainly a lady for detail, for sure. <laughs> and we enjoyed that. And of course, always a pleasure to have teachers amongst us. What would we do without them? Uh, I heard a couple of cell phones going off during that session. Uh, let me assure you that I don't need accompaniment when I speak, though I do when I sing. So if you can attend to that, please. Moving on. Uh, also the daughter of an IMAS founding member and part of the advisory committee, Dr. Indira Brunner Chandrasekhar, is our book's uh, principal author, a biophysicist by discipline. Today, Dr. Chandrasekhar is a prolific literary curator, writer, and founder of the acclaimed award-winning literary journal, Out of Print. After years of applying her PhD in research labs across the globe, she returned to her hometown to contribute with her trademark versatility and passion to the musical, artistic, and literary fabric of Bangalore. Uh, Indira, please uh, do join us uh, on stage to address your future readers, I'm sure. Please. Hello, everyone. I have slides. <laughs> So it'll take me just a second and a half to set them up. And hopefully all the lovely tech assistance I got earlier from BIC will be seamless. Is one allowed to say this? I'm so proud of this beautiful book. A tribute to many people who've been part of creating and running the International Music and Art Society. A tribute to the IMAS itself. Good evening, everyone. Suddenly you're all in the dark, but <laughs> good evening and a special greeting to our chief guest and our guests of honor. Thank you for being here. In these next few minutes, I'd like to acknowledge some of the individuals with whom this book was created or who influenced its making. As many people have already mentioned, my mother, Ila Chandrasekhar, whose idea it was to bring out this book. Although I have to say, 
She suggested a small volume with a few key events of the IMAS, an exercise that might have reached completion within the year. The thing is, my mother, herself an artist, for all her intense, quiet, refined, sensitive engagement in the arts, for all her artistic temperament, had a practical streak. So when I proposed extending the tribute souvenir to the IMAs that she envisaged to a more substantial tome, she was a bit skeptical about the feasibility of it. As the project evolved, Pratithi joined us, um, we got more involved in the archives. She stepped back from the urgency of timelines, adopted the wisdom of letting go that which you cannot control, and engaged with the text of the IMAS book with her usual grace and pleasure and enjoyment and laughter, and shared her memories and impressions of the society's heroic early years with my brother Rajit and myself. And I, who would have traveled across continents and countries and cities to be sitting strumming with urgency and tension and deadlines and schedules in her wonderful room surrounded by the everyday beauty that she created, I would relax into the process with pleasure and enjoyment. This was the last event for which she appeared for the IMAS. Uh, this was at the BIC. We were in the throes of developing the book then. Here she is talking to uh, Ravi Tambuchetti at the, uh, in the front row of the event. Um, I cherish that time. And I'm sad that she's not here to witness the completion of the book. She would have loved it. She would have received its loveliness with happiness. She would have glossed over all the complexities of its making, and just enjoyed the moment of its existence. Sorry, I'm just turning this page here. I'm sad, but I, I know that her spirit and her memories are in here, and I'd like to dedicate my research in this book, into this book, and the writing, and most of all, my pleasure in the volume to her. I cannot really acknowledge my mother without drawing attention to my father, a Renaissance man, a scientist with a wide and discerning appreciation for the arts, a deep belief in the IMAS. He was the one who first suggested inviting Malavika Sarukai to perform for the IMAS, her debut appearance uh, in Bangalore. Um, and my next set of acknowledgments is, of course, to my companions in this process of developing the book, Urmila Devi and Pratiti Punjabalal. It was a joint effort of caring and valuing the contributions of the IMAS. And I'd like to share some pictures of the process uh, just to give you a sense of what an extraordinary effort it was. Here on the dining table that belonged, uh, belongs to us, that belonged to James's family, are sets of IMAS memorabilia. Thank you, Urmila, for finding and bringing out, it was an incredible task of excavating the archives, because although you said your mother uh, maintained them so well, there was such a rich amount of material, and to really gather them together was something extraordinary. Now, the material is laid out here in chronological order. There were many, many sets of it. This is just one. And what a treasure it is. I don't know if you can see the pointer. Um, in principle, it's there. I'll turn it on again. Um, well, you can see here are the jazz years. There's, um, there's Woody Shaw and uh, Billy Taylor and uh, Chico Freeman. Here's Malavika. And on the picture on the left, there's Madhvi Mudgal. This is Zakir Hussain, not very visible from the perspective. Um, here is the Rostropovich flyer. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we have the Maharaja's Kritis, the concert which celebrated uh, his uh, compositions, two of which we heard today. Um, here's Adnavaz. Uh, and on the picture on the right, um, well, we have uh, one of those scrapbooks that, um, that Urmila mentioned and Pratiti mentioned that is just a treasure, hand annotated, a collection of material that Rani Vijayadevi gathered. Here's M.F. Hussain. Uh, and here, right in the forefront, is Maynard Ferguson. And in principle, Konarak, who performed with Maynard Ferguson in the 1970s, um, might be here in the audience or some of his family. 
Now, there was so much of this material in the book, but how to select it. So the three of us went through every tiny scrap of paper that Urmila took out, no quick decisions here. And we built a narrative that I believe tells the story of the IMAs through the events it featured because they reveal in addition to the role that the IMA has played in bringing extraordinary artists, often for the first time to Bangalore, it reveals the spirit of collaboration, the clear commitment of those who believed in the society, their deep and evident regard for Rani Vijayadevi, and furthermore, it reveals the connections that the IMA, IMA has generated within the city and beyond. So therefore, threaded through this narrative of the IMAs is a story of the city, as it grew from a somewhat culturally traditional zone with many brilliant OACs, no doubt, to this vibrant urban center with multiple venues and rich platforms for sociocultural engagement, such as the BIC. And it becomes clear through this narrative that the IMAs has been a critical part of this development of the city. Well, we had the text and we built the narrative, then we come to the design. <laughs> this was another collaborative enterprise that required patience and attention and frequent detailed re-examinations, and the result is simply outstanding, all of you will see. Thank you, Surupi, for your fine hand in this. To think that the IMA has featured your grandfather, as others have mentioned, Mr. K.K. Hebar and your Aunt Rekha Rao's first exhibition in Bangalore all those years ago. For many of you in the audience, you will have no sense of what the early 70s to, uh, sorry, the mid 70s to the early 90s was like. I have so many anecdotes of devouring those first art exhibitions of getting to venues like the Ravindra Kalakshetra in my parents' enormous gas guzzler of a car, a Dodge. It's socialist India, petrol is scarce, my mother's at the wheel looking absolutely splendid, and we, that is some combination of uh, Dumbi, Jaya, Indu, Amrita, and myself, are hoping that we don't have to push the car in our fancy silk saris through the quiet tree-lined streets. <laughs> And then the 70s also brought the magic of listening in, relative, in the relative scarcity of offerings of the time to Bismillah Khan perform all night in a friend's home in honor of Guru Purnima. Truly a privilege. And among the great privileges of that time was interacting with Rani Vijaya Devi as she set up the IMAs. This is how I remember her, Auntie Vijaya, with Auntie Jeannie and my mother on either side of her, uh, committee members. We must remember that the nature and the uncompromising quality of the programming of the IMA has set a high standard, and suddenly there was the possibility of, off but suddenly there was the possibility of offering a wider range of art and culture to the city. Now, before I close, uh, some pictures from the book. Some of you in the audience might recognize yourself. There are many more images. Um, well, uh, there is our chief guest himself, um, Lata, there you are, Patrick, so many others. You will see yourselves. I'd like to close by returning to the grace and the fineness of Rani Vijaya Devi, whose enduring legacy we honor with this volume. Thank you. To round off our special night, we are privileged to have with us the renowned dancer, Padma Shri Awardee Malideka Sarukai to present her talk, Reflections on Dance. Doubtless known to everyone here, Malideka Sarukai is one of the world's most highly regarded Indian classical dancers and choreographers. Her consistent quest for perfection, renowned technical fluency, and her brilliant translations of interpretive movements go far beyond the boundaries of Bharatanatyam. Both her performances and her choreography are exquisitely balanced between the classical discipline and the sublime creativity of a constantly spiritual and philosophically expressive artist. She has, of course, won many awards, including the revered Sangeet Natak Academy Award, and has been recognized with one of our country's highest honors, the Padma Shri. We are deeply honored to have her with us today to share her reflections on dance, Members and friends, please welcome Malavika Sarukai.
Namaskar, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and dance enthusiasts, art enthusiasts. When I was just listening to the eminent speakers talk about this fabulous book that has been brought out, it made me pause and acknowledge patronage for the arts. And here without royal patronage, which we heard you speak about, or patronage from organizations like the, like the IMAS, where would the arts be? Where would the arts be? Where would we find excellence? And this was very moving, actually. Actually, I don't feel like speaking now. I just feel like absorbing all that I have seen here and what has gone into, you know, when you see all these slides, you see the numerous artists over generations and what they have done for the performing arts. We are, as I said, things we kind of forget in the busy world we live in. But here it comes back into focus to say without patronage, without informed patronage, and organizations where people believe that the classical arts must be presented, as a society, we would have lost a lot of things. And so my indebtedness to all of them for just doing what they have done and for and for you know enri and enriching an environment where arts are valued. So I am honored, deeply honored, to be here on this important occasion of the book launch celebrating the arts, and which marks the journey of the International Music and Art Society in Bangalore, a society that was started by the illustrious Rani Vijaya Devi in December 1974. It is indeed a privilege to be invited to speak on this occasion, and I thank Srimati Urmila Devi, President of the Society and distinguished daughter of Rani Vijaya Devi for giving me this opportunity. To sustain an organization over 40 years is to reach a milestone, and I extend my heartiest congratulations to IMAS on this achievement. My friendship, my friendship with Ila Chandrasekhar and Professor Chandrasekhar, and it continues with Indra here, goes back many years. And yes, it was because your father and your mother invited me to come here. I think this was the early 80s when I came and did a performance. I possibly did an Odyssey performance. I'm not, I don't remember. But he was one person, Professor Chandrasekhar, who was so convincing uh, that he actually got me to do on the same evening part Bharatanatyam and part Odyssey. I never did this, that kind of program for anybody else in my life. The only person I would do it for was you know, Professor Chandrasekhar and Ila G invited me. And that's because I realized that his interest and their interest was so deep and respectful of art and artists that I just felt if he wanted me to do it, I should. So that was the 80s. I'm sure the book Celebrating the Arts and Enduring Legacy will be exceptional in every sense as it has been many years in the making. I'm sure it was, like I said, a labor of love. And I mean, if you didn't really, you were passionate about the subject, you possibly couldn't have created this fabulous book that we're all privileged to read. And I, as I said, congratulate the authors, Srimati Urmila Devi, Indra Chandrasekhar, and Pratiti Balal, as also the designer of the book. Thank you. I think the book will surely bring to the reader an infusion of the cultural richness in the performing arts. This evening, I'm just pleased to share some thoughts on reflections on dance, because it's been more than 50 years as an active performer. 
So there are many thoughts, many ideas, many experiences, many changes that I have seen. The creative process in classical dance is complex and multi-layered, and it's difficult to mark the years of sadhana in terms of external measurement. Because the essence that lights up the dancing body lies hidden within. It's rather mysterious, but wonderful. The physicality of dance that the audience sees is only one layer, the top layer. The artist, for much of the time, is working on the within, the inner spaces of the heart and mind, together with intention. And it is from this private space that the artist finds purpose to evolve the foundation of technique for creative explorations. A wonderful pithy saying goes, technique disguises the dancer and reveals the dance. So that's the quest, that's the search for an artist just to say, how do I find a technique that can actually make the dancer sort of move behind and let the dance come center stage. The more the artist has inter internalized the art form, the greater the possibility that the audience will be deeply moved by the dance. The experience of classical dance in its deeper flow creates an awareness, a mindfulness in the artist and audience that brings them together in a shared experience. Rasa is that moment, a moment of forgetting, when in that instance the, the egocentric notion of the I shifts, giving way to a more expansive feeling. Rasa is that savored moment, a transient, transient experience that helps us discover our hidden selves. To quote scholar Sri Krishna Chaitanya, I quote, this state of intense absorption is also a state of equanimity, of repose, vishranti, unquote. Through the engagement with dance, the artist creates an awareness of the interconnectedness of life and the universality of human emotions. It is only when there is this intense empathy between artist and audience that one lives from the everyday to the sublime. Our ordinary lives briefly open up and expose us to a sense of humanity, a sense of shared humanity, and the, and the beauty of the spirit. Through this transient experience, one is free to look at life in all its vibrancy. Dance in these moments bridges gender, class, language, and boundaries. So there's often one is asked this question, you know, how do I understand dance? Often. Because classical dance, Bharatanatyam that I perform, has a, a, a lot of, you know, very detailed language of hand gestures and it's stylized, there's grammar and punctuation and it's a vocabulary, it's a language. So there's this question of saying, how do I understand it if I have not learned it? Or, and the simple answer is, you don't have to understand it here, you just have to feel it here. So what we are asking of the audience, serious artists who have internalized the art form is saying, can we feel together? Can we all allow ourselves to feel? And that's really a big question in these times. Scholar and translator A.K. Ramanujam says, and I quote, tradition is not your birthright. It has to be repossessed, rediscovered, unquote. How does an artist repossess tradition? Because how do we as artists, do we just take something and preserve it? Or do we say there is flow, there is transition, and therefore we have to adapt? And when we adapt, what do we do? What do we keep? What do we hold within ourselves? And how do we actually translate that into, into dance and, as, and, and to the environment, into, to be able to adapted to changing times. So they're very big questions we as artists ask ourselves. And it's, it's a constant um, restlessness. So how does 
how does the artist repossess tradition? How does the artist personalize the language of dance? Is the voice authentic or imitative of another's voice? Is the articulation of dance technique honest? And from where does dance articulation originate? When the boundaries of a classical structure are gently nudged, how does intention maintain the balance between tradition and change? These are vital questions to be con constantly asked by the artist. Actually, when we work with tradition, it's a great responsibility and a burden because we have extraordinary artists who have created for generations before us. And then there's a certain legacy that we, ha we inherit. And then we say, how do we pick up this, this legacy, handle it with precious care and intelligence and responsibility? And how do we adapt it to the changing times we live in? <coughs> Rediscovering tradition is not easy. It's really difficult. Primarily because it requires a sound foundation to build upon. That's the basic structure. In addition, it requires a curious mind, imagination, an intrinsic sense of rhythm, lateral thinking, and body intelligence. Creating new work and dance is a long process a kind of adventure, that's what I try to tell dancers. I said, you know what, take the long route. Don't worry, don't go by the short route. Just take the long route, which is more adventurous and where you possibly see many more things. You know, you come across things you might not have seen before. So enjoy the route, enjoy the process. Don't be hasty to take the, the main road. Let's go wander down those gullies and see what we find. So it is the long route which is which needs to be a calling for artists. Um, rediscovering tradition, again, involves months of research. You know, people sometimes say, so, you know, they invite and they say, can you do something in, like, the next month? You know, we have, this is our, our, what we are planning for our program, and can you create something? And then one has to explain to them that actually creating work is a very rigorous, exciting, frustrating, fulfilling process. It takes time. And unless the artist is really, you know, unless there's a great impulse to create, nothing happens. Because sometimes people think that dance is that, you know, you just put it together. You have some alphabets and you just put it together. But I ask, how do you write a novel? And as writers write novels with many drafts, so dancers create work with many drafts. We go through many, many, many drafts of edit and looking at it and punctuation and grammar and wondering if it all sits. So it's really quite a long process. And I don't think um, people quite recognize what goes into the making of dance creation. So I thought this is the best time to talk about it. Bharatanatyam is, is a well-balanced art form. It explores external, internal space. It has pure dance, which, is, which explores our external space and the whole area of emotions, which is the internal space. So there's really a large territory we are crossing, a large territory for us to be uh, creative with and um, to explore and to envision. That's what dance is finally. Dance is what the, da what the artist envisions, what we see here is what you see. If I don't see, you don't see. And the act of making it being seen is the most difficult part. Because if I do a gesture, it's only a gesture. Unless I bring life into this gesture, so we say prana, breath, life breath, is what the artist needs to put into the gesture. But prana, life, this life force, is not something that is taught. We are never taught it. Nobody speaks about it. 
But on this long, as I said, decades of practice, and the first 20 years, believe me you, nothing much happens. 20 years goes in learning alphabet, learning from our teachers, from our gurus, our, the compositions, the structure, and just getting used to, oh, if I do this, it means, if I do this, it means yesterday. But if I'm gonna say, long time ago, so we are first learning what if I say, you have come, go away. It's a friend, go away. It's a respectful, go away. It's different. So where we are placing gesture, our punctuation, is, is grammar. And we're not taught breath. But over a period of time, we understand, and that's our own self-analysis or self-inquiry to say, oh, where do we find breath? How do I actually get to live the dance? How can I live the dance? We do hours of practice. Before I bring up any work to you here, I probably have already done that piece about 45 times. I've gone through it. But how do I come here, refresh myself, and dance for you as if it's the first time for me? What do I do? What do I do inside, inside here, to make it happen in the moment? That is really the test, because tradition requires repetition. It requires habit. It requires a very tedious, rigorous, arduous practice. There are no shortcuts. If you need excellence and creative detailing, I just love that word, because that's what we also fuss about creative detailing. If we need that, we need to like practice hard, hours. So that we, our practicing is like our R&D, it's our lab. We create and we practice. But beyond that, as I said, what you see is only physical. What matters for the artist is what happens inside. How does the artist generate that life force? One thing is generating the life force. The next is how do you circulate it within your body? What do you do to circulate that force? What do you do to send the force? What do you do to bring back the force? How do you modulate the force? How do you send it to the tips of your fingers? How do you send it beyond your fingers? Beyond. So movement can't end here. A movement ends there. And if I end it there, you will see it here. So these things are deep questions, exciting questions, silent questions that we individually have to ask ourselves as artists. And it's a, it's a calling. I try telling, I, we were just, uh, I was just they're talking about reflections on dance. Let's just jump to that. There's a change in the way dance is seen, perceived. Nowadays, dance is often seen as a form of entertainment. And hence, as a society, we expect very little from classical dance. I'm not talking of this audience. Generally, it's a generalization. Because most audiences are comfortable with a very passive viewing of dance. They don't want to be challenged. They come, they just look at dance, and they say, oh, something, you know, something happened, and then we go away. But that's not dance. And that's not the way we need to look at dance. And if we look at dance like that, then we expect very little. So it's um, questions to be asked in this, map, in this area. Because if we don't look for artistry, does the artist work on artistry or does the artist think, oh, it's okay, we can just do something. Okay, superficial and that's okay. So what are the questions we are going to ask ourselves as an audience? When you look around at, as I said, the changes that are happening, when we look around at uh, the younger generation, the 20-year-olds, 20 20 year 30, 40-year-olds, 
What we find is what they are doing now, these are the changes, that they're upscaling the very physical aspect of dance. Because they all go to the gym, they're all fitness-oriented. like oriented. When I learned dancing when I was 20, 15 and 16 and 20, when my guru said dance, I would get up and dance. When he said sit, I would sit. We had no warm up, no cool down, no nothing. We just danced however, we had whatever floor we were given, we danced. We didn't fuss about the floor or, or the space. We want more space, less space. Whatever we found, whatever our guru said, we, we just followed, their, um, followed them. But now I think what is happening is we're, the dancers are, are focusing on the more physical aspect of dance, which is a good thing in a way because overall you see form when you go to a performance, you, know, you see form which is more, um, you know, more confident, more aesthetic for sure, for sure, more aesthetic. But what you feel is they work on the physical but they're not working on the within. So sometimes one gets the feeling that it is, it has, it is bright, but it doesn't have luster. We need luster because that's luster is what will will give a sense of resonance. That something else in the dance, that something else in that moment, is not brightness. It's luster. And for luster, we have to be at it all the time, many times over, and find that something else. It's not on the surface. Luster lies within. And then it's about how do we get the younger generation to look towards luster, to tell them take the long path, to tell them, yes, it's, it's OK, take the long route. I think one way we can do that is to support them, is to support them. Because they are the future of dance. They are the future of dance. And I earnestly ask, as an artist who's practiced, as I said, 50 years plus, I feel for dance. And I want to know what happens to the younger generation if society does not patronize them. How do, they, how do they survive? What do they do? This is really an urgent question. Very, very urgent question. Because if we don't patronize them, and the serious among them, they lose heart. They be become disenchanted. And then they say, oh, if I do superficial, that's fine. I really don't have to look within, because nobody is asking me to look within. But we as a society have to come up and say, Look within, and we value what you do. We don't find that. As a senior artist, I'm looking around. I don't find that. I don't find people coming and saying, classical dance, we really value what you do. This organization is different. You're an exception. It's truly. You know, when I see all this, and I know the, the, you know, the passion with which you all created this organization, and the way you presented artists, it's different. But this is the exception. It's not the rule. So outside, we have a very transactional world, which couldn't be bothered about dance, classical dance. And they're all into consumption. You can't consume dance. You have to savor it. We have to savor dance. And I really feel, you know, the answer of I get very emotional. Because dance has shown me things vaster than ourselves. So I'd really like to ask you all to support the arts, to support classical dance. Please come forward as philanthropists, because we need royal patronage, 
and thank you so much for doing what you do. But we also need philanthropists. We need individual donors who come forward and are willing to pledge money for the arts. Not sponsors. We don't need sponsors because the moment you have a sponsor, they say, so what can we get? How many things will we get? How many people will come? How many footfalls? The answer is we don't know. But we do know that classical dance enriches our lives. That is for sure. And we as a society have to do something urgent because if we don't value this younger generation doing what they do, they're just going to turn away and do something else. And that would be a tremendous loss for us as a whole. At the deeper levels, classical dance invites participation from the viewers for the fullness of experience. I believe classical dance is not to be looked at, but looked into. It cannot be seen as mindless entertainment. That would be completely downsizing, trivializing the beauty of, and of the art form. Now, what, what should we do? Or well, these are suggestions, attempts to think about what can we do? Dancers on their part need to self-search and find the emotional, physical, spiritual stamina to take the long route. Walk the difficult path to upgrade their performances overall. As artists, I'm saying, what do we do? And in turn, audiences lulled as they are by passive watching, need to bring discernment into their viewing. You need to, yes, be more discerning. And my ardent wish is that organizers find the funds to program, keeping in mind quality above quantity. Very often we are told, oh, classical dance doesn't get that kind of funding. So younger dancers, many of you might not know, when they do a program, they spend 50,000 rupees. Because by the time they pay their musicians who demand their price, and they pay the, the, the costume designer, and the, et cetera, and their travel, and et cetera, et cetera, they're left with nothing. And, and this is absolutely shocking. So I think, as I said, that's why we need philanthropy. Patrons, philanthropists, sponsors of the performing arts also have an important role as funding agencies to financially sustain the arts. And with that, there is a social responsibility of creating an awareness of the enrichment that art brings into our lives. I truly believe that the performing arts in India have survived all these centuries only due to informed patronage and the vision of extraordinary artists who have generously given to their art forms. And maybe it is time now to pause and question, what is the lasting impact of classical performing arts in our lives? We live in a fragmented, noisy, divisive world where our senses are constantly violated by violence, terror, and disenchantment. Life has become transactional, where money and power define us. We have lost touch with the beauty of the spirit. Our inner res reservoirs are constantly emptied as we negotiate the fractured world we live in. Can we allow our minds to remain benumbed and desensitized by the world we see around us? Must we not find moments in our life that recognize inclusivity, empathy, and beauty of spirit? Before I conclude, a question which often comes to me is, what does classical dance do? So I'm normally taken aback because what does it do? Short point, it makes us human. It makes us, it makes us empathize. It makes us feel, it makes us relate. I relate, I relate to the world. 
if I'm exposed to dance, if I'm, a, if I'm allowed to feel classical dance, when you see an intense experience, I can't call it performance, it makes you feel. Feel things you've never felt before. So the answer to that is it makes us human. Deep within dance flows the underground river of the spirit. The art experience invites both artist and audience to dip into this river, to rejuvenate oneself. In our consumer-oriented society, perhaps this does not offer instant reward. But at a subconscious level, the art experience does help the human being aggregate the positive energies within. Increasingly, I'm of the opinion that in the present world we live in, the deeper experience of classical dance or music actually improves mental health, as it calms frayed tensions within ourselves and with it brings a sense of peace as we see ourselves not alone, but connected to a larger universe. Thank you. You're standing for dance, and I love it. It's dance you're standing for. Thank you. Classical dance. Yeah, an impassioned plea by a veteran. I'm sure there'll be many takers. Really deep, I mean, what lies beneath, fantastic. Uh, may I invite uh, the president of the society, Urmila Devi, to felicitate Malvika Sarukai. And so, ladies and gentlemen, IMAS family and friends, we come to the end of our evening. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you in many of our audiences to come. We thank the Bangalore International Center as well for this lovely venue, Sandhya, Sarva Raja, and team. And before I say goodnight, uh, please allow me to remind you that copies of Celebrating the Arts 40 Years of the International Music and Arts Society in Bangalore are available at a special rate tonight in the lobby, so don't go home without one. I'm Uday Mathan, thoroughly enjoyed hosting this for you. See you later. Bye. Bye.